So, Paul, beginning, um, what did you make of Elliot's speech? What I heard, and maybe, I don't know if this is fair, not always noted for my fairness, um, I heard Elliot describe, or implicitly at least describe, Facebook as a media company. Is that what you heard? Uh, he tried uh, not to say that. Uh, but he, he tried came, not to, or a lot to say? He, he came close to saying it. Um, but I didn't really uh, think he said he's a media company. First of all, I would like to say that Andrew did uh, write a very positive book. Uh, he did speak to many people, and all the others are more important than the one sitting right now in front of you on that stage. So it is a great read. Please look into it. There are very many positive things, how we can uh, improve situation as it is today, and I think that is the kind of discussion that we n uh, need to have. Secondly, as a media company, I'm very happy uh, that Elliot has been on stage. Um, what we try to establish in DLD is that we talk about the most important issues, the most important subjects, and do it with the people who are really into it and really changing and doing things. And we had a discussion with Dan Rose and his team last year, and they avoided a lot the term responsibility for any content. And I see that changing. Um, and if I look at that change, I'm optimistic and happy. Is it going far enough? I can't judge. Too much is in, in motion. You see that too many things have recently happened. Um, and whether, the, whether this is enough or not, I don't know. I think, from my perspective, Facebook is a media company. Um, and as a media company, you have responsibility for your content. Um, and one way or the other, they should accept it and they why, should why stand up for it. Why, why doesn't Facebook, and it's not just Facebook, uh, many of the Silicon Valley companies in the content business, uh, from Instagram to Google, why won't they acknowledge their media companies? Um, I think there has been uh, instrumental for this um, uh, a law that was done in 1996 um, by uh, the Clinton administration saying that you are not liable for any piece of content um, if you are sort of a telecommunication company. That's section 230 of a so-called CDA law. Um, and if you are once granted that position, you know, you try to stay at this because making money uh, is more easy if you're not liable for content. But I hope it will be changing. I don't know whether you have seen a, an interesting piece of statistics coming out last couple of days by CB Insight, that is a statistic company in New York, and they have been asking roughly 5,000 people um, about what company will we be saying 10 years from now that it has been net negative for society. And it has been 59%, 59% Facebook. So I think they see the writing on the wall and act, and that makes me very optimistic because they can contribute a lot to it. Paul, in our conversations uh, for my book, you talked a lot about accountability and responsibility as a citizen, as a CEO, as a family man. Talk to me a little bit about that and maybe, maybe some ways that you might be able to teach a younger generation of entrepreneurs, not only in the US but in Europe, about the responsibility of business people towards society. In many discussions that I'm having in, in the US, uh, or even in some places in Europe. I have the strong feeling that there are great talented tech people saying we are in charge for technology, society has to find out what it means for, for them. Um, I think that is a fundamental uh, division that is absolutely wrong. We are building all together the same society, so you can't argue I'm the tech guy and I'm building tech platforms and you are society and you society have to find out what my technology means for your future. It is a joint thing that we have to develop. I think that's especially true in IT because what is done in IT is mostly invisible for almost everybody. So if the people who are doing something, creating something, don't have a very responsible position we are in bad shape. You find out so late and so difficult. So where does the moral education come from? Business school, families, is it innate? Is there something Kantian in German executives that makes them a little bit more accountable? Uh, it's applying common sense to reality. Um, and um, you see that, that it's a tradition in, in Europe altogether 
um, that all companies are part of a society and that we have to build a society by being a company. So we shouldn't stop being a company, but we have certain responsibilities. Um, I think that a lot of stuff is going wrong in, in the internet, not because there is a big master plan um, that they would like to go it in an absurd direction. Um, it is just difficult to make sure that, for instance, all data that is produced is treated with responsibility. So you have to have very often much more effort to put into a thing to make it a better product, to be more protective for the people. Um, and uh, that is basically what we should be asking for. And we at Boda try to build these kind of products. So we simply try to think a little further, put the consumer in the middle of it, and try to come up with responsible and reasonable, great product. Nevertheless, great technical product. Paul, the responsibility of regulators. I know uh, Cara did an interview once with Obama. I think it was Cara, and Obama made the point that he felt that the Europeans uh, were using regulation to catch up with American technology companies and that they were doing it rather unfairly. Uh, I'm, I know you disagree with that. What should and has the role of the European regulator been and should be in terms of fixing so many of the big problems of the future? Um, first of all, um, the American success story started out with regulation. It was regulation on the Clinton administration in the middle of the 90s, and it was set up to make great and to build, allow to build great firms. So they get some extra rulings, they, they got huge amount of money, and so on and so forth. So there has been regulation in place, and it did foster the big companies. Secondly, Obama has been saying in Silicon Valley that the rest of the world is guests on their internet, that the internet is an American thing, and we all are guests on an inter American internet. I think that is total bullshit. <laughs> so, um, well, I don't know if all Americans think that, though. I, I, how many no, Americans we, are here who believe that? Is, is it an American thing? No? So, um, now the, 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 European, the Europeans have to catch up with certain things, and we are trying to do that um, on an entrepreneur's basis. But at the same time... The concerned. Who is concerned? And, uh... Yossi, where are you? <laughs> Yossi is always among us. Where are you? Yossi is the internet. Uh, Yossi is the... <laughs> So, and, and um, the, the discussion about the right regulation in Europe um, it comes at a point in time where all of us have to think about what's the right regulation for the internet, so it's a coincidence. So if you're now coming up with the analysis that Europe should do more about internet, um, and uh, say at the same time they're having that regulation discussion, um, you, 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 you shouldn't connect the dots. I think that is uh, not the appropriate thing to do. We have to come up with the right regulation, with smart regulation, and the only place where that is taking place and where that discussion is happening in a meaningful way is Brussels. So innovation is regulation. In what particular areas? I know you're quite outspoken on the antitrust front. Are you sympathetic with Vestager's essential assault on Silicon Valley on, on antitrust? Do you think it needs to go further? Has it gone far enough? Um, I, I think... Um, Always monopolies are harming societies. Um, so the big question is, uh, do we have some? Um, and if you look at the facts, and somebody is owning 96% of a marketplace and behaving like a monopoly, monopolist by adding on top product by product, country by country, and spending huge amounts of money to protect their markets, it's highly likely that there is a monopoly. So name some names. Uh, um, the, the most important case right now in Brussels is about Android and the way Google is, uh, is fetching the smartphone market. And if you want to have a personal experience on that, uh, buy a Samsung phone and try to run it without Google, it's not, not possible. So um, I, I think that we have there are certain um, uh, laws, and it's right to apply these laws even to digital. Um, is Ms. Mrs. Vestager doing it uh, in the right way? All what I can see is that she is very educated about it, that she's extremely serious in trying, out to, in trying to find out the facts, and that she has a stamina to say things others don't like. So um, she's a great politician, and let's see what comes out of it. As the CEO of a large, I think it's the third largest media company in Germany, 
What do you make of the uh, General Data Protection Act, this new law that's coming into place this year? How, how relevant do you think that will be in terms of opportunities for you to take on these large data companies? Um, first of all, what is in the very core of it is that your personal data belong to you. Um, and I think at some point in time we had to clarify who owns your personal data. And, and that is quite clear, it's you. Now, there comes a lot of technical uh, uh, stuff with it, and all of us have to figure out what it technically means, how, how we can really deal with it. But the fundamental point that you own your own personality, even in the digital world, and th that nobody should be allowed to keep it forever and do with it whatever it wants, uh, is the right fundamental thing. We all have to figure out over the next couple of months um, uh, how we deal with it. I think um, what, goes what, what doesn't really come out in that discussion in a proper way is that for most great products, you do not need personal data. You do not need to profile everybody to the uh, to this, uh, most single issue and keep it forever and share it with everybody. So what we tried to show, even in search, um, that was meant to be a problem where you have to have all kinds of personal data and where the current search companies are profiling you to death and keeping all the data forever and shared with most people, uh, it is not necessary to run a great uh, search product. And that is what we tried to prove um, by doing our own search product, uh, which is in the market, um, which is a faster and better search than Google, um, and which is not, put, not taking any of your personal data, but keep it with you. So you're saying basically that the Google and maybe the Facebook business models are flawed and maybe in the long term can't survive. Is it kind of like the American car industry in the 1950s that dominated and they built cars that were less and less safe and in the end the Germans kind of caught up by building cars that consumers actually wanted? Um, I can't say that. What I can say is that, Why there, not? that there will be a next generation of product and that that next generation of product is having significantly less harm to individuals um, and serving a better, a better service and serving being a better product. Will they be owned by the current uh, incumbents? I don't know. Uh, it's hard to say. I don't know whether they can change. Um, I'm quite confident if they can't change, others will do, and will we be trying to be one of the others? There's been a lot of talk, particularly in the US, around Apple, uh, about technological addiction. More and more people in, in Silicon Valley are acknowledging, particularly that their smartphones are addictive. What do you make of that? Is technology, the, 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 the smartphones that we all, I've got one in my pocket, of course, we all do, uh, are they addictive, particularly for kids? Um, they can be. Uh, it's the same discussion we had about TV 20 years ago. Um, and uh, yes, some people who think about education must come up with rules that kids don't spend their whole day in, in front of these uh, technologies, in front of these things. Um, I am on the side of uh, Ian Golden last year. He presented his ideas about the new renaissance, about mm. the great things that we can expect from new technology. Um, but we have to make sure that we end up, that we end up on the positive side of it. Um, and it takes our action to end up on the positive side. Um, and um, that can even mean that parents are doing a normal thing educating their kids in using new media. Do you fear AI, again, more and more talk, and this will be one of the dominant themes of DLD, that we're creating technology so, so smart that we'll undermine ourselves, take away our jobs, and even subjugate us as a species. Does AI scare you? Uh, AI doesn't scare me. Uh, again, it needs a discussion, what are the fields where we don't want to progress? Uh, how much progress do we want to have in genetic uh, frequencing? Um, how, how, how much do we want to influence what kind of human beings um, are born and are not born? So I think there are certain areas where we should have uh, discussions, but uh, by and large, AI is supporting humans. So if we do it in the right way, it is enlarging our capabilities rather than reducing them. Making us more human, of course, the question is, what does it mean to be human in an age of artificial intelligence, of smart machines? In my book, I, I, I focus in this area on education. Uh, how important is it in the context of AI and all these technological challenges to reinvent, to disrupt, to change our education system? 
Um, I think education systems should never be stable in the sense that they don't uh, are bit developed further. So we have to understand what the capabilities of IT mean for us, um, what it means to be responsible in the societies we are building, and that is a continual thing. So staying at the experience of 1900 uh, definitely is a, the, the wrong thing to do these days. Um, and we find out that it's extremely hard to change the way you educate young uh, people. Um, and uh, we should put more emphasis on, on doing it in the, in the right way to prepare them for the lives they have to be expecting. Are there, uh, again, in Silicon Valley, one of the most innovative schools, ironically, are Waldorf schools where technology and screens are banned. Um, where do you see the role in te of technology in, in innovative education? Should kids be subjected? Should they access programming and technology at an early age, or should they focus on their innate creativity? I'm, I'm not an expert in that. I'm sorry. I passed that question. Um, too early. I, I think it is an important item, but it's not the most important item. So most likely, they should understand before that how to read and how to uh, how to, to count and how to do other things and how to be good humans. And at some point, I think it's helpful, like a foreign language, um, to understand what, what IT is all about. So the role of technology in, 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 in learning how to be a good human being, you, you don't really see much of a role for technology in that. Um, I, I think that it's not a particular uh, technology role. I think people who understand what it means and to understand and can interpret technology should be involved. Um, is it an IT kind of education in a limited way? I see that, but not beyond that. What about the role of citizens? Everyone here obviously is a citizen. What can people do in your mind, whether they're in or out of the, of the industry? How can they help fix the future? In my book, I invent something called Moore's Law, Thomas Moore's Law, which um, it's very different from Gordon Moore's law, Thomas More being the 16th century English author of Utopia, focusing on agency. Uh, in my mind, the great challenge in our age today is reasserting our agency. How do we do that? I think all of us are consumers, so we have a voting right in the market. Um, by doing the right thing as consumers, we can influence a lot. Um, all of them would like, all of the companies would like to capture um, our time and would like to capture um, our, um, our, 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 our using the products. So we have a lot of power. Um, if we use it in a proper way, we can change a lot, like in all normal markets. Um, and the more standards are understood and m the more it is clear what comes on the backside of products, um, I think the more people can decide how to behave and, 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 and what to do um, by consuming and using products. Paul, where are we in the narrative? Uh, you know, every year at DLD in events like this, you know, people bring up the, the baseball analogy, you know, we're in the first inning, the second inning, the inning the game hasn't started. It seems like we're on the wave of a, of a new set of revolutionary innovations, AI, virtual reality, the Internet of Things. As a German, you're very good at historicizing things. Where are we in 2018, 10th anniversary of DLD? Are we at the, still at the beginning of this thing? Um, I'm more a soccer guy, so we okay, only, so we, so we only have- first half or second half? We, uh, we only have two halves. I'm, we, are, we are clearly in the second half. Um, so we are coming to the decisive moments, a 60s minute. Um, so normally at that point in time, the, the trainer, the coach is changing a few people on the place and deciding should we uh, be more aggressive or more defensive. Um, so I think uh, we are in a very decisive moment. Um, and uh, that means all of us have to be involved in leaving this not only to tech people, um, but having a broader discussion about what it means for our society. So 60th minute. 60th minute. For any uh, English soccer fans here, there's the old uh, joke, uh, England plays Germany, um, and it's always a draw until the 90th minute, and then Germany wins, or they win on penalties. Uh, so you enjoy so that So we, we, we look bad for a very long period of time, and then finally we make it. But in terms of this... That's our intention, by the way, this time as well. <laughs> but in terms of this idea of the second half, I know that Angela Merkel talks about the second half too, and the idea of 
Germany and maybe Europe fighting back. Uh, so we're at the 60th minute of the game. You may be a two or three nil down to America. Can you come back? Um, we, we will, I think we will be developing a different uh, model. Um, the US more is built for the huge monopolies that would like to have global reach. And basically that's the same thing I see in China. And basically the, the, the policies and the tools they are following are very similar. Um, I think the European model will be a more divided model, so we will see significantly more companies, but they will never have the size of these huge titans. So I do not foresee that we will have a company based in Paris worth 500 um, billion uh, US dollars. We will have smaller companies, and that fits much better to the European thinking and to the uh, European way to organize lives. Um, if you look at these companies, we even today have great companies, a lot of great companies, and much, much, much more to come. So the environment has become significantly more entrepreneurial, significantly more money is flying into it. Um, and uh, in, in terms of regulation, so that we have a single European market where you can really act, I think we, are, we have progress. Could and it be faster? Always. And you think those European companies, the smaller ones, may be better for society than the larger American companies? Um, for our society, clearly, yes. Uh, for the Chinese society, I can't judge. For the US society, I think you have to make up these uh, decisions. So for the headline writers out there, Paul is saying three worlds, a Chinese, uh, three technological worlds, the old ideal or maybe dystopia of a, uh, a, a, a universal global market no longer exists, a European model, an American model, and a Chinese model. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and there's uh, some similarity between the Chinese and the U.S. model. Wow. <laughs> so it's, uh, what are the, the final question, uh, I've got 30 seconds, easy one. Uh, what are those similarities between the Chinese and the American models? All wanted to build uh, a handful or maybe two handful of global market leaders um, and uh, dominate the way other people act in these markets. Uh, and that is something we definitely don't see in Europe. Well, I'm definitely staying in Europe. Thank you, Paul.